and get the recording. So we got recording this this time, which is good. Um, like I said, last time I was unfortunately running an appointment that was only supposed to take an hour, and the guy was a chit chatter and ended up taking about two hours. But um, we didn't get the first one recorded. Plus, I want to go back through that first one anyway and edit some of the things and make it a little bit more clear. But uh, it was a real good conversation. Like I said, uh, thanks for taking the time out today. Um, hopping on the on the call. Like I said, we're doing a four part series. Um, talking about mortgage protection, going over the in-home process for everything that I say and do, why I say and do it, and what I'm expecting to get returned from the client or what I'm looking for in the client uh, uh, responses better help me um, figure out what option makes the most sense for. So um, definitely have a strong passion for it. It's 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 uh, one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, so thus I wrote a whole entire book about it. So we're getting ready to publish that thing once we find the right source and platform to do it we will get that out there but um kind of recapping we kind of did the what most people call the orange bubbles kind of the the basics um of what to explain to the client in terms of the whole process um what they can expect a little bit about the bonding report process so um like i said that's a it's a good tool um for those that haven't seen it give me one second oh here it is share this right here so this is what we were uh, talking about before. So if you can see it now, um, should be actually, hold on one second. Let me just pull this up on my phone. Sorry, I just want to be able to see uh, what I have going on on my screen. Awesome. So yeah, so you guys can see the bubbles for those that are on their laptops. Um, yeah, so these are the orange bubbles I was referring to. This is up on the Google Docs drive for IFG. Um, it will be soon on the IFG University page as we are recording these to be able to one shoot the videos for them as well as um get some of that more content up there for you guys so those are the bubbles like i said i'm not gonna spend too much time on them because we kind of already did that and i really want to get into this nuts and bolts piece um of step four or five as well as six so um, with no further ado we're kind of going to jump on in um i'll use a couple of examples from yesterday's uh cases as well use red today just a little bit older all right perfect so in the general information section so once i figure out the why um, hold on i'm gonna mute everybody out wow if everyone could mute their cells for me that would be awesome make sure there's no more feedback All right, perfect. Some more echoes. Sorry about that. All right, good. Um, any questions, you guys can unmute yourselves, that's fine. Um, so going through this, like I said, the general information, that's probably the nuts and bolts of the whole presentation. It's understanding what's going on from the, not only from the financial aspect, for the mortgage, also uncovering some of the more deeper financials in terms of savings, 401k, retirement. Um, this is probably the most important section to help structure the plan of what makes the most sense uh, long-term for the actual situation for that uh, client. So, I mean, Obviously, the first one is going to be name. The reason I do this is to keep the information separate so you know who's who. Um, and then the next bubbles, you're looking at age and uh, date, date of birth. Um, the reason I do this, it makes it easier to quote, for one, but also for those, those couple carriers, like uh, foresters, for example, that use age nearest, it's always good to have their birthday down in front of you so you're not fumbling later to ask them what their birthday is. 
Um, trust me, once you quote the wrong price enough times and the client's not happy, you show them $15 more a month um, just to do a, to the simple eights nearest fact, um, you will not make the mistake twice over, I promise you. So um, that's why that, that, that is on there. So those are the kind of the two main simple ones. They're very simple, not really much explanation behind those. Then it comes into the next basically five sections. You have your working section, your income, mortgage, savings, and then married. Um, this is, honestly, like I said, this is the nuts and bolts of it. Um, a lot of agents, they want to breeze through these handful of questions, or some don't even ask half of these questions. But this is really where you're going to get the foundation of what kind of plan are we, are we talking about. Um, are we looking at term options, looking at payment protection plans? Um, how is this really going to look? I mean, this is going to give us the big financial picture of not only currently of how the client's sitting, um, but as well as if someone were to pass away, how does that change their financial aspect? Um, is the income going to change? Is it retirement money? Is it uh, working income? I mean, how does that all look um, for that whole situation? So our job as agents is to uncover that as well as explain them, okay, Mrs. Jones, if something were to happen to your husband, Bob, here's how this financial outlook really looks for you. Um, so the first question is, it's working. Um, simple question, yes, uh, you want to know if they're working or if they are uh, re retired, but this is also a good point, too, to help through that bond and report process to try to find another common ground or uh, kind of be on the same page of things with the actual client. So when I ask that working question, it's for me to basically get to know them a little bit better, understand what kind of job they actually do, how long have they been doing it, um, is it their own business, um, do they, some, if it's a state job or a regular company, um, that, those are all important things to know what kind of benefit structure they may, they may have, whatever your state is, that could be a little bit different things for city and state employees, um, a lot of different things that are very, very important uh, to understand because that's going to, once again, shape the picture of what we're looking at. So working question. Um, next is income. So I always ask the income, this is Mr. Jones, I mean, what's the ballpark monthly income for you? Um, it doesn't have to be an exact number, just looking for a ballpark. Getting this information is going to be able to tell me what are they bringing in monthly, as well as uh, once I get their mortgage amount, I can see what their biggest bill is. So I can kind of gauge how their income levels are. If it's someone that has a little bit more expendable income, where showing those bigger premiums might make a little bit more sense for them. They might be able to afford it easier. Or if they're on a, a tighter budget where you realize, oh man, there's only three, four, five hundred dollars of extra cash left over after the mortgage payment, I need to be very um, direct and uh, very precise about what I'm actually showing these clients to make sure I'm not going to show them something that's outside of their, their wheelhouse budget wise. So, for, for example, we fill this thing out. We got it. We do Bob. Say Bob is. That's actually too big. I don't, I don't like that. Do Bob. Bob says 45, uh, one, 10, uh, whatever the year was, 80. I know it's not, I know it's not the right math, but um, if he's working, all I'll do is put a nice little yes, he's working. How much is he making monthly? We'll say he does $2,000 a month. Um, important question. What is your guys' uh, monthly mortgage payment now, a month? So assuming, I always say now a month, assuming that they either came from an apartment where they rented, or they came from a pre-existing home, or they refinanced their house. So typically, um, any type of mortgage, it's going to be a different number than what they're used to paying. So I always ask the word now, just to understand what, what are they actually paying for on a monthly basis. We'll just say $1,000. Let's see, she's 40, here one, nine. Nine, that's not right. So just putting on the both husband and wife, this is on a basic situation. I mean, we're looking at, like I said, they're about the same age, they're both working. One brings in two thousand a month, other one brings in a thousand. So the mortgage would be a thousand dollars, right? So that's usually taxes, insurance, all that stuff inside the same price point. You want to get the whole the whole entire number. Um, why is that important to us? Because one, now you can see they're bringing in $3,000 a month and their biggest bill typically is going to be their mortgage, which is a one third of it. So there's about $2,000 of wiggle room left on over um, in terms of current spending um, if they're both living, right? Um, 
Also, wh why is that number important to us? If we're looking at going to a payment protection plan or a critical payment plan, um, one being whole life using to take care of a series of house payments, other being term, do the same thing over a series of years. Um, we gotta know what their monthly mortgage payment is so we can divide the coverage amount to show them how many months or years of house payments that, that plan's actually worth. That's a huge number to get on the front end of it so you're not asking that question later on after you show the numbers to fumble and figure out uh, what kind of math you need to do or um, how much is their house payment. So getting that on the, on, on the front end of things um, makes a, a huge difference. Um, then probably the million dollar question, no, no pun intended, is gonna be the savings question. Um, almost all new agents, they do not, or they neglect, or they don't know any better uh, than where they don't even ask this actual question. But this is the question um, that I would call definitely um, one of the five game changers uh, is gonna be the savings. Asking them, what are you guys gonna have in savings? Um, is it any type of 401k, 403bs, pension, retirement account, CDs, cash? Just that as, as, as a general question to get some type of ballpark number, this is where you're gonna find your annuity money. Any type of IULs where it might be something separate from their, uh, their insurance product, um, this is where you're gonna kind of gauge that information. Um, and as David put it, put that inside your back pocket for later. Um, that's going to be the big difference to be able to bring something else up to them down the road of hey are you satisfied with the return you're currently getting um what if i can show you a way to maybe improve that would, would you be open to it i mean all of those types of questions it would be really stem from getting that savings question so assuming them they have 401ks now if they're currently working at that job i'm, I'm probably not going to worry about touching that but it's good to know just to use it as leverage um, something were to happen, use it to our advantage or make it worthwhile to get something lesser in coverage. This is something else. Hey, Marcus, is. Go ahead. Real quick. Um, when you, I know I've heard you say it before, but I'm on to hear it again. Um, when you ask about their savings and the, the typical question that you always get, right? Why do you need to know that information? Can you remind me what your answer is? Yeah. So all the insurance companies, they do a financial background check um, to make sure that you are soluble or um, be able to qualify for the same product. So as if, so some people ask the question as if they're using it just on the application or they pull out the application, um, there's always gonna be an income question as well as current insurance, current assets. It's always gonna be tied into that um, application somewhere. But um, when people try to, to push back on it, I'm like, it's just, like I said, just general information, doesn't have to be exact numbers. Um, I always, that's always been my safety net to say it that way, where I'm not being really invasive or really nosy about it. And the way you ask the question is probably the, the biggest way of doing it. Um, when I ask that question, my head is down. I am writing on this thing. I'm filling this thing out just how you guys see it. And I'm just running through it just like it's, it's totally normal. Like David puts, if client won't make it awkward unless you make it awkward. So I'm, my head's down, anything in savings, 401k, 403b retirement accounts, anything, cash. And surprisingly enough, I mean, some people, especially if they're newer home buyers, they're probably gonna, they're gonna say no, because um, they just probably liquefied their whole entire savings to get, get their down payment money. So I mean, I'm, I'm looking, this is more so for, like I said, this, this situation, um, I wouldn't really dig into it too much. It's when they're closer to 59, 60, or in, their, or in their 60s, I'm really gonna hammer in on that actual question because that's really where, where some magic can happen from even some rollovers. Um, doesn't mean you can't find a rollover. Once again, while you ask the working question, if they have changed jobs, um, they had a previous 401k account, now it's inside of an IRA, that money's fair game to move. Um, it's because they started a brand new job. So most times they, that company's 401k, they end up staying separate, they don't roll that over, it's inside of an IRA account. So that's also, during that fact finding, why some of these questions are very important to take note of. Because um, if they say, yeah, I just recently switched jobs. I worked there for 20 something years. Now I'm starting this new job only like about two years ago. Then lights should be dinging. Um, bell should be going off knowing that, hey, he probably put into a 401k plan on his previous job. Let's try to find out where that money landed. Is it rolled into an IRA account? Um, did, he, did someone already beat me to it and put inside of some type of annuity, some a safe money play. Um, just really digging into that information and finding out. Um, that's like say if someone switch, switch, switch jobs. But usually I said, I'm not really digging into that question too often. 
um, unless they give me some type of cues, like I said, about the working question, or if I know once I get to that, usually past 55 range, where I really start asking those, those questions, um, or really like 58, 59 for sure, um, knowing that because there's some type of play we might be able to do in the next six to 10 minutes. So it might not be an immediate play, it could be a down the road later on in the, in the year, but um, just asking, just getting into the habit of asking it on all situations will one, make you more confident on it. And two, it makes it, it just flows smoother. Um, and it's, you'd be surprised. You find people that switch jobs that didn't roll over their, their money or it's stuck inside of a bank or an IRA account. Like I said, those are some fair game accounts. I mean, you can definitely do some damage with those and um, get people into some safe money options. Um, does that answer the question for you, Deanna? Yes, thanks. Yep, of course. Um, and next and last is my favorite question, married. Um, especially for spouses, it's one of my favorite questions to ask. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of a twofold question. It's one to see if they're actually married. So most insurance applications, they ask um, who's the actual beneficiary. Um, it's a, that have some type of insurable interest. Um, also, it's good to know if they are married, if they're fiancés. I mean, there's a lot of different things that you have to ask just because of insurable interest. Um, as well as I ran into some crazy houses to where I would assume that they were married, they weren't, um, they were sibling. It was just, it was just weird stuff. So I always want to ask that question just for the get, make sure everything makes sense. But um, the reason that we ask this question though too is to help stir the emotional pot. What I mean by that is asking someone, are, are you guys married? And following it with the question, oh, for how long? Or they tell you 35, 40 plus, 40 plus years, then I always ask the question, follow up again, so what's the secret? Um, mind you, I'm a newlywed, I've been married three and a half years, going on four, so um, most people you see, they're usually gonna be married 10, 12, 15, 30 something years, um, doesn't matter how long they are, I always ask the same question, so what's the secret? Um, what this does, it gets them to laugh and chuckle, it's definitely a tongue in cheek joke, for sure, um, but it gets them to stir that emotional pot, and think back to when they first met. Um, you get them to kind of go down memory lane and reminisce, and as she's thinking about the answer to tell you of what's the secret of the husband's, uh, she's over there laughing, or either she's shaking his head, or he's telling you work, work, work different shifts, or have your own man cave, and all that other tongue-in-cheek jokes, one of them is going to tell you a serious answer. Um, either make God, um, put God into the center of it, um, have communication, trust, um, never go to bed angry, any type of answer that, that they can give you, it's, it's them really thinking about a, a situation or evaluating their whole entire time being married. Um, once again, think about the emotional ties behind it, to give you a truthful answer. So I always ask that, that, that question is to one, stir the emotional pot, um, two, to kind of soften the mood some, just by telling a nice little tongue in cheek joke to get them to laugh, get them to chuckle, um, get them talking about each other. And then it kind of goes back to almost being a serious when they tell you the real reason of um, what their actual secret is. Because um, I always tell people, man, hey, I'm, I've only been married three years. I need all, need all the help I, I can possibly get, um, which is a truthful statement. I mean, so when, when I tell them that, I'm, and I started laughing about that, um, they really try to tell you some really good, good advice, um, which, like I said, it keeps that emotional pot stirred for you, and it keeps us going down the right path um, of um, – when we go to kill them off or go through the pain piece of it, it's gonna make that part a little bit easier um, for them to actually figure out what they're gonna do with their actual property. So, um, so that's probably like I said, my favorite question for sure. And then um, the last one is the current insurance question. So another section, um, like I said, some people blow right on through it, they don't even ask, they're, their heads down, focus on mortgage protection only. That's all they're going to talk about. Um, but if you don't ask the current insurance question, you're opening yourself up for objections. Like, I already have work coverage. Um, is this life insurance? I already have life insurance. Um, is this? Um, they talk about Colonial Pan, ARP, all that, all that nonsense that they're able to get, or already have enough coverage. If you don't ask the current insurance question, um, you can be shot down by the time you get through this whole entire presentation and end up with. Um, being stuck because you didn't overcome this when it first happened. So usually there's going to be two different things that are going to happen when you ask about current, current, current coverage. It's going to be private, as in they own it, or it's going to be from their actual job. Um, either of which, they can be worked the same exact way. Um, you have two options. Either use it to your advantage, 
uh, which is to help say if they have a bigger mortgage. So especially some of you guys in uh, Cali where they're building with four, five, six, seven hundred thousand dollar houses. Um, if they have a policy for three hundred thousand, use that two year advantage to only have to worry about covering the additional four four hundred thousand. Um, on the flip side of that, say if I'm dealing in the Columbus area with a two hundred thousand dollar house and they already have a four hundred thousand dollar policy, um, I'm going to spend that policy. I'm going to get that money spent as either income re replacement, uh, usually what that's what the job's for. Um, they're usually going to give out one to two times, maybe even four times salary, depending on the, the actual company they, they work for. So that will give Sue or the wife the same lifestyle if Bob passed away um, in terms of income and so forth. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to spend that money. So we can't, so that money, that 400,000, that's going to last you only about four and a half years of that same lifestyle, Sue. So I'm assuming you guys probably sent this form back in to get something separate so you don't have to touch that money to live off of to help pay off the house, right? Um, get them to agree, get them nodding, get them going down the same path as you. Because um, if, 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 if that's not what they wanted or they are allowing to use some of, that, some of that money, it's better to know on the front end so we can use a partial of it or then knowing on the back end where it was, it's way too late and um, they've already kind of shut down way, way before you even got to the actual pricing. So, um, and so those are typically the two ways you either you're going to use it to your advantage and to help supplement. Um, I hate saying the word rebate. I know some people, they say that word for that situation um, where they can basically, they use the other policy to bridge the gap between the, the new policy to cover a certain amount of money. Um, so be very careful using that uh, word. But um, like I said, I always just leverage or um, spend it. That's usually the way, the two options. So not only are you talking about income replacement, you're talking about college funding. Um, if they have daughters, you have to talk about weddings. I mean, there's a lot of different things that you can talk about to spend that money or that money is going to be accounted for. Um, so therefore, it's not going to be there when, by the time they actually uh, would need it for the house. They would definitely need, need some more than that. Um, going over to the next side. So we kind of already got the financials on one whole side of it. Then we kind of switch over to the medical. So on the medical side, um, definitely you want to ask any type of tobacco products. Don't just limit it to smoking because you will get burned by someone that chews tobacco or they, they smoke a pipe, um, nicotine patches, just get in the habit of any type of tobacco products. Um, put yes or no. So for these guys, we're looking at no and no. Um, another important question, height, height and, and weight. Um, once again, been burned by this a couple times by not asking it till the application and then having to pivot to a whole brand new company. Um, it, trust me, just ask the height and weight question. Um, especially if there's a couple and say the wife's a little bit bigger, um, always make a nice little tongue in cheek joke. Hey, Bob, close your ears. And then, um, they, she's either will say he already knows, or she'll write it down on a piece of paper for you. Um, just, just like I said, don't make it awkward. Um, like I said, clients get awkward when you make things awkward, but if you kind of break it up with tongue in cheek jokes or understand what you're asking and think of them as normal, nor normal people, um, these conversations flow one, wonderfully. So, um, that's always, like I said, another fun one is, um, getting the height and weight, um, from a spouse. So like I said, I've always had them write, write, write it down or she'll end up whispering it to me or she'll just say it out loud or, or Bob will hop to the next room, something. So it'll be always something fun to laugh about later. Um, next section, probably the second most important be health challenges and med and medications. Now, if you notice, I call them health challenges. I don't say health problems, health issues, health ailments. Um, those all have negative vibes. So the word challenge kind of makes it a little bit more neutral. Um, it doesn't imply that um, you're perfectly healthy, but it also is not going to imply that you're not eligible for any type of coverage because you have health problems. So health challenges, um, they're just stepping stone for us. They're just a bump in the road to, to overcome to make sure we can get to the right option, um, which is the beauty of being a broker because we have many options to always offer people no matter what, what the situation is. So in this section, I'm usually going to break it down. Um, obviously, you can put each of their names. Um, each of their names down. And then in these sections, I'm just going to write down the, the note. So I'm going to ask the typical questions. Um, sometimes they may have told you on the front end, but I always ask me to blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, heart attack, stroke, cancer. I mean, all the main questions or um, 
hey, Bob, um, what type of medications are you, do they have you currently taken, if, if any? Um, he goes and grabs that whole entire list or he'll run through the meds. The longer you do this, um, the easier it is to start deciphering what medications are taken for what. Um, so if someone gives you a list of meds, say like um, hydrochlorothiazide and Losartan, you know those, those are, those are going to be typically blood, blood pressure pills. Um, metformin, glipizide, glyburide, those are going to be your, your, your diabetes pills. Um, Janumet, Novolog, they start getting into whole, the insulin field. So um, once you do it a tad bit longer, you start realizing what certain meds are being taken for. Um, as a general underwriting rule of thumb across mortgage protection, file expense, or just any type of insurance, any type of health challenge, you always want to know the diagnosed date. What meds are they taking with dosage? Name of their doctor and the frequency of the med that they're actually taking. So usually about four nuggets of information. Almost every ins um, insurance application reads the same way and tries to get the same information. Um, if you're doing e-apps, it's a little bit easier that you can't mess it up in terms of it'll give you all the different boxes and the questions to ask, um, as well as they will populate majority of the questionnaires as well for you, certain carriers that do um, require those, like American Amicable, um, Americo has a built into their application. Foresters has a couple questionnaires that will auto populate. Some other ones you have to go pull them up yourself. Um, same thing with Mutual Omaha, they're requested by underwriters. Um, so, yeah, like I said, some companies they do have questionnaires to help, help with some of those issues. But um, let's say if you're doing e apps, you really shouldn't run into those problems very often um, as everything should populate for you. But um, just, just in doing this, like I said, I'm not. Always try to keep a calm, steady, straight, straight face. If you have a good poker face, use it. Um, don't be um, the agent that makes cringing faces or different facial expressions when they say certain drugs or when they say something that's going to um, kick them out of a certain category for term. Just keep everything normal. Always agree, okay, that's perfect. Um, maybe ask a couple more follow-up questions if they're not sure about certain drugs. Like, for example, a lot of the, the asthma drugs are also given for COPD. So asking good follow-up questions to make sure what they're actually taking it for is definitely really, really important. Um, but I mean, getting that inf information, oh, sorry, not too big, I can't zoom out, there we go. So doing that, I mean, that's definitely, it's like, important just to be able to, um, one, know what's all happening health-wise and also see if we're still on the same page for, for term. So once you get to this point, um, number six, call senior underwriter. Typically, that's going to be code for call your upline manager or post to the, to the, the group me chats. Um, this is typically if you're kind of stuck on certain drugs, medications, um, if the client's still eligible for the product you're thinking about writing, um, this is the time to reach out, especially if you're newer. I always advise um, at least the first 10 to 15 appointments calling from every single house just to go over the same in information. And when you're talking to a, um, your upline manager or whoever's helping you figure out the case, um, you're going to basically run through the same information twice over. So you're going to say, hello, Adam. Let's use Adam Reese for the for example. Hey, I'm sitting down with uh, Bob and Sue. Uh, we're looking at a couple different options for mortgage protection. Um, Bob's 45, non-tobacco, brings about $2,000 a month. Uh, monthly mortgage payment is 1000 bucks. Um, and then Sue's 40, uh, non-tobacco as well. Looking at it, uh, brings in $1,000 a month. And uh, health is fairly good. No major health challenge or meds being taken for them. Um, let's make sure I'm on the right track um, coverage-wise. Um, what options do you, would you suggest looking at? So and then that the agent or the manager will understand the, who kind of runs through the whole situation. Hey, they're 45 and 40. We could be looking at probably 20 and 30-year terms, maybe a return of premium option, and then whatever their mortgage amount is, tearing up the pricing for a three-option close. Um, but giving the underwriter that information, um, basically recapping, um, not only does it sound good in front of, of the of of the client, but you're able to mentally recap that you covered all the questions and all the key pieces of information that you would need um, to better help that um, understand what what situation is going to probably be be the most sense, most uh, likewise to make the most sense for them. Um, and in this section, too, you can take your notes whatever he gives you, he gives you carrier names or face amounts of coverages. Um, you can definitely put down your notes and you can put down, say for example, do Foresters, uh, yeah, Moo, and then Amam, 
We look at 200, 150, and then 100, 100. I mean, whatever that said, whatever notes he ends up giving you, he's taking there just so you know what, what to quote on the whole back side of it. And then uh, this step seven, we save that one for later. That's going to be your post close or your takeaway, um, which we just ignore that question for now. And we're going to go on to the back of this thing. So for those that haven't seen it, um, it's a basically it's a nice little um, grid on the right hand side with different boxes to quote um, years, coverage amounts, carrier names. Even has the mortgage payment protection um, breakdown on the very bottom of it as well. And then in the top left hand corner has a nice little grid to show the the rate that a loan would go would go down. So this is probably the one of the most important sections. Um, because this is going to be the point to where we can basically show them how to pay off their loan a little bit quicker uh, than most folks. So the way that works, um, I always tell people, um, not sure if you had a good loan officer or, 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 or a bad one, but I always ask, I mean, did they tell you about the tips and tricks to pay off the mortgage early? Um, and like I said, usually about 40% of people have no idea whatever you're uh, actually talking about. So I mean, it's a good chunk of people to still explain it to them. And the way it works, it's one extra house payment a year knocks off seven and a half to 10 years off their mortgage time frame. So one extra house payment a year means a full month of mortgage payments, basically. So for example, this couple, they're doing a thousand dollar a month payment. If we were to divide that by, so they can make, make an extra thousand dollar payment. Um, I go one step further um, and divide that by, by 12. So they can send an extra small portion of that every single month throughout the whole entire year. Um, thousand divided by 12 is gonna be 83. So an extra $83 a month towards the principal would knock off seven and a half to, to, to 10 years. So what this box is showing, so we want to establish that. And so it's 30 year loan, we got 45, we got 40, so that's going to be 75 and 70. So this little box right here um, helps explain that to them. Um, as well as if you're getting, especially for an older couple or someone that's paying off their house early or they can't get a 30 year term, this is gonna show them the reasons why to have a lesser term, like a 15 or a 20 year product, um, especially if budget becomes an actual issue. Using this kind of diagram to help show that the balance goes down and the time shrinks, um, it's really powerful to get them into those lower options that make more sense for them financially, but yet still make a solid option in terms of covering the actual mortgage for them. But um, going back to the reason I give them the nugget of how to pay off the house early, it's not only is our job to explain the process of selling insurance, it's also to help educate the, the home buyers into different ways that can benefit them um, long-term by having an actual mortgage. So I always found it worthwhile to be different than other agents and give them a little bit of education um, and different um, ideas to help pay off the mortgage sooner, um, just to stand out, to be a little bit different than the other agent that could walk in either before or even after me. So if I took the diligence of, I'm not just typically selling them something, but I'm educating them along the way about how different things work, how the old plan worked versus the new way, and going into um, how, how to leverage your mortgage and pay it off sooner. I mean, you're gonna look just like, just like a, a hero to them because you're not just trying to sell them a policy, you're trying to spend the time with them to help educate them so they understand how this stuff works. With most people, especially the first time home buyers, this is all gonna be foreign to them. So taking the extra time with those people to make sure they know what's all happening, um, he said it's very be be beneficial to you um, to make sure you look, look better as uh, an agent, but also just from a professional standpoint, doing the right thing and educating these clients is what we always strive to do. Um, and then you will always be rewarded for it. Um, maybe not in this particular house, but in terms of business long term, it always takes, takes care of uh, itself. Um, the secondary way, so some people who came across the same thing, pay off the mortgage early, um, they might have mentioned the bi weekly option. So some banks do talk about that. Difference being, um, that's the bank taking the money twice a month from the actual client. Um, reason that's just like paying the one extra payment a year, there's two months out of the year. This, this is actually one of those months where there's five weeks inside the year, or inside the month. Um, therefore, when those two months equal out, it ends up being a whole nother pay cycle. Um, so therefore, that's one extra house payment. So um, it's just knowing, knowing those little tips and tricks just to educate the client uh, makes like, so the world of difference on, a, on that whole front of it. So once we get to this point, so we kind of broke down, we see at 200,000, it's a 30 year loan. So we add up their ages. So 45 plus 30 is 75. 
Um, so this would be the loan time, and this is this arrow going down. This guy, basically showing as time goes on, this loan balance of two hundred thousand is going to keep going down. The longer the time frame goes out, the lower the balance gets. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory on that. Um, but the reason I use that, 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 that visual is for those people that are, say, 35 or 60. They have a 30-year loan. We, knowing damn well we cannot get them a 30-year term, we have to get them to a 20- or 15-year product for it to make sense, not only from a budget standpoint, but also being able to even qualify for it from the underwriting standpoint. So showing a diagram like this or explaining those extra tidbit options of how to pay off the house earlier, shrinking the time of having that, that, that loan, not drawing, drawing it out for 30 years. It's gonna help when you show them a 15 or 20 year product, make a little bit more sense. Um, or um, as, as Rick's on here, he would know them. Um, I use that to leverage getting a, a sale um, by telling him to put the difference between two different options into the, onto the house payment versus spending the extra 75 bucks a month for the only 50,000 of more, uh, no, 25,000 of more coverage for 50, like 75 bucks. So um, those options that you can use it to your advantage. Um, but before we even show a lick of numbers, so this next step's not listed anywhere, but it's, it's, it's called the, the pain question. Um, this is where we're gonna kill the, the income earner off. So what that means, so looking at between Bob and Sue, Bob brings in 2,000, Sue does 1,000. Bob is the primary in, income earner. So what I'm gonna be able to show them, or um, I put this page right, right on back, back, back over, I'm gonna map out and say, hey Bob, um, now I'm gonna to talk to Sue directly, but um, Bob, I'm gonna kill you off, I'll bring you right back, I promise. Then focus all your attention solely on, on the um, spots. Just ignore him, just if he tries to talk, tell him he's taking a nice little dirt nap, just ignore everything that Bob's saying and focus on what, what does Sue have to say. Um, so Sue, God forbid something were to happen to Bob tomorrow, what's the plan for you? And just, just sit back and wait for her to give you an actual answer. Just hang out, relax. It might be a minute or two. Um, just sit back and wait for her to, to tell you what, what, what her plan is. Um, some people, they have a, a clear-cut plan of, and it's usually gonna be, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep the house. That's what she's, she's probably gonna say the first thing. Well, I definitely wanna keep it. Um, if she doesn't give me an answer, I might probe her with a couple more questions. I mean, would you be able to keep this house, Sue? Would you have to downsize and sell it? Um, what, what does that look, look like for you? Once again, sit back, um, relax, wait. Then from there, I mean, she tells me she wants to keep it. I'm like, okay, great. Um, how do you plan to keep it? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the sheet right back over to her. I'm gonna put an X. So in sakes of coloring, put an X through Bob's two thousand dollars. Well, Bob passed away, so this two thousand dollars is gone, and, and this is from a work income. He's still working, right? This isn't any type of retirement or anything. So that means if something happens to Bob, that means Sue, you're left with a thousand dollars a month, and your mortgage payment is a thousand dollars a month. How does that work? And just the same face I'm giving you guys, kind of the blank. Um, what what does that mean or what how does that work then i mean she's gonna be like well i don't know um or she'll say well that's why we would have insurance to cover it um once again that's a huge buying signal of them understanding how this situation really plays out this is why we ask these health or these uh, financial questions or general in, in, in information questions is to be able to physically see how does this actually transpire if something were to actually happen um because unfortunately if this and you can tell this to bob or you can say this while bob's still dead um bob i mean fortunately we, we can't make this plan later um, um if something were to happen you can't go back in time and figure out what what to do next uh, so it really makes a lot of sense while we, we talk about this stuff so you can understand how this really looks and while you're still here you're able to make you put the plan in place to make sure it all makes sense and this doesn't happen to you to, to, to your wife, where she's either stuck living um, very, very skinny or risk losing the house totally due to not being able to actually afford it. Um, does, that, does, that, does that make sense? Um, which they're usually gonna agree with you once they, they see that from that vivid standpoint. And then from there, that's where I'm gonna go into the actual quoting. Um, and the way I usually quote, so I'll put down the company name. So we'll just say, for uh, ease of sake, so they're 20. This is gonna be a 20 year. 
30 year and a 30 year ROP. Um, that's a year. So then I'm going to show the full entire amount. So we got 200,000. I'll do a 150. And then what I like to do for my third option is what we call a 50 50 plan. So I do 100,000 with 100,000 accidental. Um, so, so for this situation, like I said, I always do a three option close, um, which usually happens. I'm going to show them, like I said, two basic options. You know, price there, price there, price there, price there, price there. And then I'm going to go into your, your money back options. So this one, you have a price, then you put back at 75. And then you repeat that down at the bottom, each of those. So what I do, I write out all the different figures. So in this option, it might sound crazy, I'm, they're going to have nine different prices. Um, what it does though, when I explain it to them, I'm going to go back, I'll explain it. So there's two different options. You can, you can cover this, um, Bob. You can rent it or you can own it. On the rental side, you're going to have these guys. Which, let me highlight. On the rental side, I don't know if that doesn't work. So the rental side is all of this stuff. All your basic term products will be renting. Um, that's where you're talking if, what that means, your level coverage, so the face amount, so 200,000 stays the same for the set period of time, 20 or 30 years. Um, same benefits, you get the living benefits, you start talking about li the living benefits, critical, chronic, terminal, you can start bringing that, all, 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 all that stuff up. But the big thing to say is at the end of that policy, if nothing happens, you go your way, the insurance company goes their way. All that money you spend is just for peace of mind. Um, the, all, the other way to do it is, is the, 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 the owning, the, the ownership. Um, just like how you own your house, it builds equity. Well, these policies, they build cash value. So same benefits of renting, um, as in level coverage um, from the face amount, level price point for a set period of time, only thing different at the end of that policy, if nothing happens to you, you get all the premiums you paid into the, to the, into the policy back. Does that, does that make sense? So you get 100% of the money back if you don't use it. So just like when you, you're paying into your mortgage, you're building equity, well, the same thing goes for this actual policy as well. You pay into it, and if you don't use it, you get 100% of the premiums you put back into the policy. Now, keep in mind, every company is slightly different. Most of them are going to be at the 100% mark. But uh, be very careful. If there are different options. Um, you know which ones you are explaining. But um, then from there, I'm going to read off every single quote. You know, 200. It's, um, this price for 20. This price for 30. This price for the 30-year return of premium. Um, go through each each of those nine options, and I'm going to sit back and say, now of those, Bob, what makes the most sense budget-wise? So looking at their income, they're about 3,000 total. Mortgage is about a thousand. So you add in their other bills, they're probably an extra what seven hundred to a thousand dollars of cash flow. So ideally, if this premium in this top one for the whole entire amount, um, for this particular situation, there's not much cash flow. Um, they're probably not going to be looking here. They're probably not looking at that top option. Um, this is the reason why I do a three option close because most likely they're going to like the idea of the return of premium if it fits within their budget. They're either going to land at this one. Or they're gonna land at this one. So if you guys see me post on those chats where you see the KC Life 100,000, 100,000 accidental ROP options, this is how I usually get them. Because I know that they like the idea of return of premium, but they don't, they don't like the price of the extra, almost double the pricing for the whole entire amount, but they do like this, the sense of the 100, 100. The summary is like, well, that's $100,000 of coverage and 100,000 accidental. How does that cover the whole entire mortgage? So understand accidental death, the way it works, or the way the actual table, actuarial tables work, more people are prone to die of an accident uh, before the age of 65. That's kind of the limber stat. Um, as they get older, past 65, the tables flip, they're more prone to go of natural causes. So in the logical approach is to leverage them dying of an accident is more probable 
um, and also to help with their actual budgeting. So I use this for people that are, have tight budgets or people that smoke. This is probably, you'll see a huge difference for people that smoke and be able to get some of those other, um, get them covered for where it makes sense. But the way, it, the way it's actually gonna be drawn out to work, so once again, the reason why we know how much their house payment is, a $1,000 a month house payment is gonna be equal to, sorry, people keep calling me, and you know I'm on the call. Let me get, do some math for you. So you got $1,000 or $100,000 death benefit natural causes divided by a $1,000 a month payment that equals 100 months. Divide that by 12, that's 8.3 years. So this would be 100 months or 8.3 years. So the reason I'm explaining this, so this is how I tell, I tell the client, they like that option. Well, the, here's the 50-50 plan. The way it works, you basically take your top amount of coverage, divide it by two. So you do 100,000 of natural causes, so something happened naturally, you pay out 100,000, and we pair it up with the same amount of coverage in accidental. So God forbid death by accident, like a car wreck, um, you fall off the front porch, hanging Christmas lights, whatever the case is, they'll pay out this hundred plus this hundred equaling the full $200,000, which is enough to wipe off the whole entire mortgage, right? That's if death by accident. But if something were to happen naturally, it still takes care of $100,000, which in your case, you're either looking at 100 months worth of house payments or it gives Sue 8.3 years to be able to pay inside this house without making any type of financial changes. Does that, does that, does that make sense, Bob? Usually they usually nod their head. But that's the, that's the important of showing a 50-50 option, which I think it's a, that's definitely a huge game changer of once you understand how that concept works. But um, just be very cautious. You don't wanna show this kind of option to someone over the age of 55. Understand that most accidental products, they drop off in terms of the policy at age, either 65 or age 70, depending on the actual carrier. So what that means for this gentleman, he's gonna have 100,000 of coverage plus 100,000 accidental. If he goes with the ROP option, he goes to this option right down here, then basically say if this was, um, let's do KC Life for example, since uh, we talked about that earlier. They have accidental until 870. So that means that he's gonna have this 100 and 100 plan basically for 25 years then the last five years, which when he's 70, that accidental portion falls off. And by all means, by that time, he's not gonna owe 200,000 on the whole entire house. He might be in the range of owing only 10 to 25,000, where even if he died, that $100,000 death benefit is still enough to get that thing taken care of and then leave money behind for the, for the actual wife. So I think that's a good stopping point, um, just explaining how I quote. Um, how I kind of get through, like I said, um, the middle section of kind of the nuts and bolts, um, how to call in your upline manager or your senior underwriter to and uh, relay the information to them. But I think it's also very important of going over how I show different numbers from someone that's healthy, doing a 20 and 30 year term, and then pairing up the 30 year ROP, um, as well as explaining to you guys that 50-50 plan. But I think I said, if people can master the 50-50 plan, um, you definitely will get people into a lot more um, better priced products in terms of coverages, but you have to understand how the concept works. And like I said, it's leveraging for a couple different reasons. Either people that have a tighter budget that want a little bit more more coverage, people that are younger, um, or people that actually smoke. Like so be very cautious in not showing this up to people above the age of 55. That's when most companies don't let you write accidental. So be very cautious on that point. Know, know your products for sure. But um, like I say, if you guys see me put up a lot of those KC Life ROP options, they're usually 50-50 um, plans where we're covering the whole entire mortgage um, with half of it being natural causes, the other half being accidental. But yet it still makes sense for them long-term and gets them into a situation where it fits for their budget. So like I said, typically, some people, they ride out the whole entire time, but this also, it could be a stepping stone um, of coming out of the house with some type of application. Um, the client might like the top option. If it saves it's 200 bucks a month, uh, the 150 was 100, 150 and the 100 was the one the 100. Hey, right now 100 bucks fits budget wise. They just moved in, they're getting situated, they're getting settled. I mean, sympathize with them. Understand that they're normal human beings. They have budgets too. Um, understand that whole, si the whole situation and be on their side about it. 
say, hey, let's get something in place, at least get started. Because um, the last thing you want is health to change and they can't get anything later. I've had it happen multiple times. Um, but knowing that, hey, we can start here, then next one to three years, we can graduate the policy. Same thing applies for getting a basic term. Say, hey, maybe I like the idea of ROP, but hey, I only can afford the 20 year term for $35 a month currently. Okay, let's, let's start here. It'll be a starting point. And then as time goes on, the next one to three years, once you get situated and settled, we can transition this into that money back option. Um, I mean, don't be afraid to do that either. Um, at the end of, of the day, we want to educate the clients, explain to them the various different options, and don't make the choice for them. Show them good enough options to where they'll make the decision on their end, and it's always going to be a starting point unless they go for the, the big Shanu policy on, up front, which it does happen from time to time. But more, more times than none, they're going to be getting something mid the mid range, which is why I do a three option close. They kind of fall within that 150 or the average premium for MT is about 70 to 80 bucks a month. So they're going to fall into that actual range or some people are going to value having that money back option and substitute that for a little bit lower coverage in terms of a plan style. So like I said, I mean, don't be afraid of that. It's just like, it's a good concept, which we'll keep covering these different concepts. Um, and doing like, a lot more content and videos on them, so it makes sense. But um, so we got about four minutes left. Thank you guys again for uh, taking time to, to listen in on part two. But um, anyone have any questions? I do, Marcus. Um, do you ever leave your numbers behind? Do I do. People, how yeah. do you? Uh, when they say to you, uh, well, we're not ready, whatever, you've exhausted all your arguments and whatnot, and they say, um, can you just leave the numbers with us? And I assume you don't leave the sheet. So I do leave the sheet, yeah. I just take, a, I take a whole picture of it, or I'll copy it over to the, the, the actual lead card. Um, yeah, I mean, there's some of those groups where they're super secretive. I was inside of a house where the guy literally left nothing behind other than his card with some quotes on it and he like handed it to like to the guy so secretively so i couldn't see the pricing um because they're they're worried about getting about about getting beat it's the only time agents they're scared to leave numbers behind because it feels another agent will come behind see what they were talking about and either discredit it or they'll, they'll pick it apart and try and beat pricing on it um i'm just very confident enough that what i show them is usually the right option i leave everything there because okay. it's it's one very like that they probably will not call you back anyway um yeah. and two i mean it's worth a shot if they come across this paper a month or two from now and harry has my phone number on it and my name if maybe they aren't they, they will call me back but um at that point i mean you really have nothing nothing to lose but i just know what other agents do which is what your what, what some some of our groups do if they came over from different places they leave nothing for them to have but no i mean all this stuff from the carrier, other than this sheet itself, you have to print out yourself. Everything from the carrier is totally free. So I'm leaving them this sheet. I'm leaving them the brochures on the, on the actual product. If I have some, li some living benefit breakdowns, I'll leave that behind with them. I mean, I'll give them as much information as possible just with the hope of, and it doesn't cost me nothing other than time, but the hope of if I, if someone else tries to come, come in or they're, but when people usually do that, we're not ready yet. They might've got another phone call. They might've sent in multiple letters. Um, or they're just un, they want to call their their financial planner or call their um, auto insurance guy. What, whatever the case is, they're they're basically saying they're, they they just want to shop. So I feel it's in my best interest to leave them as much uh, materials as possible, um, just to give me the better odds of hoping that either someone doesn't have they don't explain the products well enough, they don't leave enough information behind on them for them to actually read up on it, um, to where I'm going to be a little bit different in that whole aspect of it. Okay. So. So that's just like I said, that's my personal take. Some people are they're weird about doing that, but um that's what uh, I personally do. Um but um yeah, other than that, um any more questions? Yeah, Marcus, I got a quick one. This is John Tempest. How are you? What's going on, John? How are you uh, doing well? Uh I've been trying to set up a couple of appointments. Uh I've got uh two people that are insisting that I call back which I said, well, that's not normally how we do business. But this one in particular, I'm going to get your take on it. She said, 
Well, we, uh, we're getting uh, multiple quotes and we just want the, the cheapest thing out there, which I know, you know, that's not always the best. But anyway, she said, um, and we have um, other companies that are sending us detailed information, all emailed to us, whether she's telling the truth or not. And she said, so uh, I just want you to put together what you can and email it to me. And I said, well, I'd be more comfortable coming over and at least meeting you first, and then we can discuss it, and uh, you'll at least know who I am and blah, blah, blah. And she just said, no, we're not at that stage yet. I would rather you just email me. Do you have any uh, rebuttal on that to at least get in their house so they can meet you, and at least that way? Yeah, you know, so I mean, I was going to be, hey, the way I, I tell them, hey, um, Mr. Jones, I'm a little bit old school. I like to know who I'm actually dealing with, and I want you to know who you're dealing with. I like to sit down with you face to face, answer all of your of your questions, because I mean, unless you're um, this this, be careful how you say this part. Uh, unless your state insurance license means some of this stuff can be very hard and difficult to actually read and, and follow up on. So I just want to do do my justice to you is at least deliver it to you, shake your hand, so you know who I am, as well as I just want to be there to answer any questions that you might have, or um, so you're not confused on how the program actually works for you. Um, well, I, to I totally agree with that philosophy, but what if in this case, because she was very adamant, she just says, no, not at first, I'd rather you just email me, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll get back to you after I give her that whole spiel. Yeah, so I would, I mean, I wouldn't even send her quotes, to be honest with you. She would get a, a brochure email from me, because yeah. at this point, you would have zero inf information. So assuming if other people did it, she's probably getting quotes from stuff that's going to be fully underwritten or they might be super low in pricing, but there's, there's going to be a reason behind it. Um, now, she did, not, she not did give me all the medical information. And oh, she did? I do have that. Yeah. And that's yes. why I thought I could set up the appointment after I got all that information. I said, okay, well, uh, let's schedule a time. What's good. You know, in the afternoon, whatever. And then she point blank said, no, 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 no. Uh, that's too early. I don't want you to come over yet. And then told me about the other people emailing, et cetera. But I have the information on her. She just didn't want me to come over physically uh, yet until have, she saw what Have I you door knocked her? Well, no, I could just surprise her, but I, I don't want to get her angry either because she said, I don't want you over yet until, and I, I was very polite. I said, well, it'd be nice just to meet you and you can see who I am and uh, it'll just take a few minutes and then I can go from there. She said, absolutely not. So. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. I, would, I would just door knock her, to be honest with you. That's what I would do. Yeah. Okay. I was I was down the way seeing Mrs. Jones. Just want to stop by for you and drop off your information packet. Have all your stuff printed out right. and have your brochure ready. Um, if you're trying to beat beat prices, probably quote a term made simple and mm -hmm. try to undercut everything else you've probably seen. Um, it's not the ideal situation, but try to get something. Yeah, something. Um, but uh, one, one last quick question: Did you say that I hear you correctly that uh, Kansas City Life does offer return of premium? Yep, they do, on their seller term. Great, okay, well, I've got them. Okay, thank you, appreciate it. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a, I said, um, ideally you have enough leads and people to talk to, to where, uh, like I said, I'm not fighting over that, that one client. So I'm either gonna try to persuade her via phone call, or I'll put her away for a week or two, and then I'm gonna go door knocking when I'm, when I'm close by, have the information ready, but just let her know that, say, hey, I just wanted to make sure you actually got it. This stuff is, it is confidential. Um, we'll make sure you actually got 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 your hands on it, and I was able to shake your hand um, to be able to meet you. So, but if you don't, as long as you don't at the door come off as a pushy salesperson, that's probably why she's being apprehensive. So, just just, just that's that's my personal take on it. But yeah. I mean, if people don't want me to come out and talk to them, I don't have time for them. So, right. all um, right, thank you. All right. Yep. Yeah. Any other questions, guys? Awesome. If there's nothing, uh, once again, thanks for taking the time out today uh, for no, part number two. And then, like I said, uh, we will be picking this up same time next week, going over part uh, three, and then um, probably go over some talk about uh, payment protection, uh, go over some of the sales situational concepts and so forth, and then um, probably do on part four, same thing, a recap, and then open up for full blown questions. So definitely, um. Any type of MP questions like John's, you have real good questions, write them down, type them up, um, have them ready for the uh, end of this month, and we'll definitely cover a lot of that stuff and have a nice little Q&A section. Other than that, hey, you guys have a real good week. Enjoy it, and uh, I'll see you all soon. Take care.